And seconds ago, drop boxes closed. Voters making their voices heard in key races across the state. So thanks for joining us tonight. And good evening. I'm David Rose. I'm Eliana Gomez. We have team coverage tonight. AJ Janivelle live in Tacoma with eyes on the race for mayor. Hannah Kim is closely watching the Seattle City Attorney Contest. And Olivia Lavoie is at the campaign watch party for candidate Lorena Gonzalez for Seattle mayor. And Brandy Cruz has complete analysis of all these major races. And we begin tonight with the race for mayor. Jennifer Lee live at campaign's watch party for Bruce Harrell tonight. So, Jen, what are you hearing there? Hey, David and Aliana, it certainly has the feel of an election night party. It's lively. There's tons of people. We're at Block 41 in Seattle's Belltown neighborhood, and you can really sense that build up and anticipation as we wait on those results. So, I want to tell you that Bruce Harrell did walk in about half an hour ago and he made a walk around the entire room thanking people for supporting him over the last several months up to this point. I can tell you that we are expecting to hear from him shortly after those results come out. No, so now we want to show you, of course, his opponent is the current council president, Lorena Gonzalez. We are still waiting on those results. The polls, ballot boxes just closed. And earlier today, we also caught up with Harold as he made his last push to get out the vote. The former Seattle Council president says if he's elected, he plans to make noticeable changes that people will see and feel in Seattle. He says it's unprecedented to have two people of color running for mayor, and he couldn't be prouder. This city had the audacity to elect a person that is half Asian and half black to its highest office. This city should be proud of what it what it's done. It's looked beyond differences and looked at a person that hopefully can carry the mantle of leadership. So I'm real proud of this city. And of course, Harold was talking about the fact that he is one of the candidates for Seattle mayor. And okay, so we are just getting the first results. It says that Lorena has 65% of the votes. And let me just uh, take a second to pull this up right here. It says 35 for Harold right now. Uh, but of course, you know, these are numbers that we're going to continue tracking. And, you know, Harold says that he's been focused on homelessness, climate change, public safety, and policing, all the issues that people here in Seattle have been deeply wondering about, caring about. So it'll be interesting to see who the next mayor of Seattle will become. Again, we are expecting Harold to take the stage. Right behind me in a few minutes, we'll continue our live coverage here and get back to you in just a, sh a short few minutes. For now, reporting live in Seattle, Jennifer Lee, Fox 13 News. All right, Jennifer, thank you. We do expect result numbers to be coming in between now and 820, but it's a little bit early yet. We'll have those numbers for you the second we get them. And let's go out now to the headquarters for Lorena Gonzalez, the uh, candidate running against Bruce Harrell for the very latest in what she's hearing from that candidate. Olivia? <laughs> Well, David, it is an absolutely packed house here at the Hill City Chop House in Columbia City. And the energy has certainly picked up since the polls closed. Now, Lorena Gonzalez arrived here not long ago, surrounded by friends, family, and many supporters. Now, if Gonzalez is elected, she will be the first Latinx to serve the city of Seattle as mayor. Six years ago, she was the first Latinx to be elected to the city council. And more recently, last year, she was elected elected to be president of the council. Now that's a big appeal to many voters that she's well versed in the issues that the city of Seattle is facing. But Gonzalez says it's not just her political background that makes her really understand the issues. She said firsthand her family has gone through the same struggles as many others during the pandemic. She says she truly understands just how difficult it has been for so many people and that further drives her to want to tackle the city's issues. And we're to check back in with you soon, but for now, we'll send it back to you in the studio. All right, Olivia, we'll check back in with you a little later on once we get some of those numbers in. Thank you. The other race we're keeping a close eye on is the city attorney's race. Yeah, this person will have a very important impact as they shape how Seattle handles crime. There are no results yet, so let's go right out to Fox 13 News reporter Hannah Kim, live from the headquarters of Ann Davison, the Republican candidate. Hannah? 
Yeah, so David and Aliana, I am in North Seattle and Ann Davison's camp. We do have another crew that's focusing on Nicole Thomas Kennedy, her opponent. But as you can see right now, you know what? Hey, this is a pretty festive atmosphere considering we have COVID-19 here. So it can't be a normally big crowd that we normally see in other election years. But this is her camp right now waiting for the results. And Ann Davison here just arrived. So we wanted to pull her in and ask her a few questions here. Uh, thank you, Ann, if you wouldn't mind joining us here for the interview. Um, I know that you, I was watching you work the crowd earlier, thanking people, hey, 8 p.m. has gone and passed. So the votes, if you haven't voted, it's too late. But you're hoping right now that what? That you have enough votes, obviously. Yeah, this tonight is about saying thank you for people who have spent their time and energy and, and taken some part of their life out to work on this campaign. Uh, and, and that's what tonight is about for me, particularly. But how nervous are you? Because in the primaries, we know that Nicole Thomas Kennedy, your opponent, she edged you by a little, but she had more votes than you coming out of the primary. How does that make you feel tonight? I'm just grateful to be here. It is fantastic. And the, the people that are here, again, have made so much space for me, asking for help. Help, favors, uh, anything they can do to pitch it to make sure we get the message out to people, and it's been super, super great. One of the things that have made, been made big about your campaign, especially from the opponent side, is the fact that you know you went from a Democrat to a Republican, and in a city where there's a lot more Democrats than Republicans, there's no secret. The the other side is saying, hey, look, she does not align with the views and the ideas that we have in the city of Seattle. How worried are you that that message is going to resonate? Uh, I don't think it has gone very far. I mean, you can see my, my endorsements from our former governors, Locke and Gregoire, 30 retired judges, which is unprecedented we've seen in any campaign. Uh, it is significant. This campaign has been about unifying people. It is about finding commonalities. It is about talking about what is happening in Seattle and its future. And that is what the people that have gotten behind me see and, and believe in. Uh, and it is a way to talk about it that is, again, focusing on commonalities and uh, not alienating people, not continuing in that type of uh, divisive talk. Uh, I think we're all looking for a way to come together jointly and to move forward. So you have said that if you were to be, to be elected, that you would collaborate with people. That is your narrative, regardless of their political spectrum or what they feel about a certain issue. But your biggest thing you told me before was crime in the city of Seattle. How are you going to fix that? How are you going to make it better if you were to be city council or, excuse me, Seattle city attorney? Yeah, I, I think they, they go hand in hand, right? Because again, when, when someone has maybe a, a different perspective or opinion about some other issues, when we're talking about safety in the in where people live uh, and where people work, and where people are looking to how we can we help people in need that's the same kind of conversation and it doesn't have uh, significance in regards to partisan issues or, or other types of issues it is a, again a way to focus on commonalities and we're all people when it comes down to it and we all have common human interests that we think are important uh, and that is where we can focus Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Yeah, check in with you later in the Great. evening. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for coming out. All right. Well, that's Ann Davison here at her camp. Again, we do have another crew that is focusing on Nicole Thomas Kennedy because there's obviously another side to this, a very consequential race, if not one of the most to date, because we're talking about two polar opposites running for city attorney. Guys, back to you. All right, Hannah, thank you so much. We'll check back in again a little later on, speaking with Ann Davison there. And now we're taking a live look at her opponent's watch party in this race, Nicole Thomas Kennedy. And we're bringing in Brandy Cruz now to kind of give some more analysis on this. We just heard from Ann Davison uh, speaking there live with Hannah Kim. What do, what do we make of this race? Again, Hannah's a consequential race. Yeah, I mean, incredibly consequential. One of the things I want to note about this scene is actually from our producer on the ground, um, uh, Nicole Thomas Kennedy is not going to be speaking to the press. So she's, or she's at least not going to be doing an on camera interview, which we thought was interesting, Ann Davison just did. Well, we'll um, wait for her tweet. I'm we'll sure she'll, <laughs> she'll share <laughs> something, right? Speaking of tweets, you know, this is a race that has gotten a lot of attention. Some reasons, I, I think, uh, more so than others. Obviously, the tweets were a huge thing. You know, Nicole Thomas Kennedy had a series of tweets from only a year ago um, that were really, really terrible. I mean, I don't know that there's another way to put it. Tweets about the police, tweets celebrating crime, and this is uh, a woman who wants to be the top prosecutor in the city of Seattle. And so that really elevated this race to uh, the level of national intrigue, if you will. But equally, I think, is interesting a dynamic is the fact that Ann Davison is a Republican. She ran for Seattle City Council. Um, they're, they're nonpartisan races, but everybody knows she's a, a Republican because she ran for Seattle City Council back in 2017 or 2019 and lost, uh, and she was a Democrat at 
at the time, uh, and then she turned around and ran for lieutenant governor as a Republican, lost, and so she's running her third campaign in as many years and trying to be elected to office as a Republican, and that has not happened in the city of Seattle in decades. So it is hard to sort of predict what's going to happen when you have a lot of progressives in a place like Seattle, mm -hmm. but what do you think is going to happen in the mayor's race when you have uh, pretty strong candidates here that a lot of people know in both uh, Bruce Harrell and Lorena Gonzalez? Yeah, well, look, you know, and this is back to Ann Davison's camp here. Uh, one of the things, and I will caution you, always on election night, election nights in Washington can be very anticlimactic. I mean, we sit here, this is the stage where we're refreshing, refreshing, waiting for the, the first uh, 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 drop of ballots. But then, you know, you sometimes don't know the results for days. And in a city where you said, like you said, David, you have very progressive candidates, those candidates tend to do much better later on. I mean, we mm -hmm. saw the Seattle Socialist City Councilwoman Shama Sawan come back from a nine-point election night deficit where her opponent was basically claiming victory. And yeah. so we're always tread very lightly on election night, even if someone has a substantial lead because we know that that can be made up uh, over time. And so, you know, as far as the chances, I, I never venture a guess, but we do know that the more moderate candidates have been polling better. There's not a ton of polling that's done on uh, races at the local level, but Bruce Harrell, for instance, has been polling better than Lorena Gonzalez. Ann Davison was polling way ahead of Nicole Thomas Kennedy. Uh, and so, you know, we'll see how accurate that polling was. It's going to be interesting to see how they all work together when we're thinking about all Seattle's candidates and all the work that needs to be done in Seattle. It's not going to just be one candidate and the other. They all really have to come together to get this city to start growing and moving forward and in a positive part of direction. That's what's, what's going wrong in the city right now. There isn't that coexistence, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so even if you have new candidates, new people in office, that doesn't mean they're going to work together better than the people who held those offices before them. Hey, Brandy, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, Fox 13 has you covered for all the angles of the election. We've got more for you and hoping for some results coming up after this break. Stay with us. We'll be back. In Tacoma, all eyes are on the race for mayor tonight. Incumbent Mayor Victoria Woodard faces a challenge from Steve Haverly. And we're taking a look here, we're waiting for those numbers to still drop in. We're expecting them around 815 is usually when those numbers come in. But let's go out to Fox 13 News reporter AJ Janifel joining us live from Tacoma tonight. AJ, there's a lot hanging on this race. What can you tell us? Just a few minutes ago, there was a, a pretty big celebration that happened here behind me. We're working, as you said, to get the most recent numbers. But this is a big race for this city. Tacoma has faced a lot of battles this year, specifically in recent history. There's such an emphasis, such a focus on the crime, the violent crime in this city. And this is something that both candidates say they are focusing their efforts on. It's a big role to fill being the mayor of this city. Got a chance to speak with current 
Mayor Victoria Woodard's earlier in the night about her reasoning for wanting to pursue a second term, talking about the fact that there is still unfinished business that she wants to bring to this community, the changes that she wants this community to see, changes that she has started. Again, you can see behind me that celebration. We're going to work to get those numbers, but I also got a chance to speak to the competitor, Steve Haverly, earlier in the night. Haverly, a newcomer to politics, but a lifelong member of this community. He told me about the changes he wanted to see. I got a chance to talk to him about the emotions he felt throughout the last few months campaigning in the city. The way people have rallied around this campaign has been eye-opening for me. Um, people have come out of the woodworks that are involved in the city and into the inner workings of it all. So it's been really amazing having them come out and support me the way they have. Just the com competition between these two people, both so passionate about this city. You can see behind me, Mayor Victoria Woodard's now speaking to the community about this race, the folks here congratulating her, saying another term coming. We're going to let her speak. We'll have more on this night from Tacoma in a few minutes. We're going to stay here and listen to what she's saying. Guys, I'll send it back to you. All right, AJ, thanks very much. Let's go right out to uh, mayoral candidate Bruce Harrell in Seattle, who is talking to the crowd right now. Racism and unfairness by our police department, but all communities want to be safe. That's a unifying element. Let us, let us eradicate racism and, and, unuse, and unreasonable force, but I want our children safe. I want my grandchildren safe. And so this should be a unifying discussion yes. that in a city that has many resources and compassionate people here, we can actually solve homelessness. We can actually solve it. We have to own it first. Yes. And we realize that we've had decades and decades of underfunding and mental illness and drug and alcohol issues and special education and the, the cracks by which people fall through are huge, but we can fix the problem when we work together. So I have to tell you that <laughs> I did not do this by myself. I have to tell you, I had a team. And so I'm, I, I, I would embarrass myself if I started naming all the team, but I just have to name a few of them because because I feel compelled to. And it starts off, of course, with my family, my, my wife, Joanne. <laughs> Do you know that during um, part of the campaign, we had gotten some emails, and many of you know, I was, the, the, the team knows, I was up very, very late at night responding to the emails, 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 emails. And people were saying I was talking about my wife too much. <laughs> so, well, you, 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 you lead with your, your you lead with your strong hand, right? Uh, of course, my children, Jason, Joyce, and Adam, who I, who inspired me, inspired me to be better. And I will tell you, Monisha Harrell and Tammy. that they didn't do it just for me. They did it because they too are passionate about the issues we're fighting for. Um, Jamie and Katie, my other family members, this was a family affair. And I will tell you, while I would like to think that they did it for me, they believed in me, but they believed in our message. And the reason you were invited here tonight, and I could look at all of you, the reason you were invited here tonight. Well, let me be honest with you. A few people I saw and I said, how did they get in? <laughs> Why are they here? I, I, I did ask the question, but that was only like four or five people. So minus those four or five people who I'll embrace and I will love, you, you they, they are here you are here because you played a role in my campaign. All of you played a role in my campaign, whether it was raising money, texting people, doorbelling, working at grocery stores, collecting those darn vouchers. Um, 
you, you believe in what we're trying to do. We believe in this city. This city has awesome potential. And I will close, I will close by saying this, that I, I mentioned this several times, that when we talk about social justice and making sure we have a pathway of opportunity for everyone, that I'm just going to ask by show of hands. And I'm, I, you, know, I, you, know, I, you know, I laugh a lot because that's what we're supposed to do sometimes. How many in here are half Japanese and half black? Raise your hand if you're half Japanese and half black. <laughs> See that, Jimmy Rogers, two-time Rose Bowl champ. Jimmy Rogers, put your hand down. And I say that not to say that, look at me, never. I mean, that is not the point of that. Um, the point is that when I grew up and we talked about race issues and we talked about the content of one's character, it was very difficult for me as a child. I just didn't know where I fit in. And so I made it a life's mission to not look at just race. It's apparent. We, get, we, we celebrate our diversity, whether it's religious or any way you define diversity. We celebrate that. But I always had to struggle to find out what we had in common. What we have in common, that pathway of commonality. And I will tell you, when you celebrate that, Seattle, when you celebrate that, you can do amazing things. I once heard a quote, and it said this. The quote went something like this. It said, when after harnessing the winds, the tides and gravity, we will harness for God the energies of love. And then for the second time in our history, we will have discovered fire. We're going to put Seattle on fire with our love. We're going to have a new, a new conversation on homelessness, a new conversation on education, on transportation, on climate change, a new discussion because it's going to be rooted on the love we have for each other and the love we have for this city. Thank you very much, Seattle, Seattle voters. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're coming out now. We are just watching uh, mayoral candidate Bruce Harrell give a brief speech on, you know, some of the ideas that he's run his campaign on, homelessness and crime and, you know, racism and policing, but still protecting the city and protecting the people, and we're getting some numbers yeah, in. Quickly Bernie. numbers, and we'll head over to Lorena Gonzalez's camp. Bruce Harrell currently leads 65% to Lorena Gonzalez, 35%. Is she speaking now? You want to go to her? Yep, she is. Let's take Lorena Gonzalez. Her, who the next mayor of Seattle will be. On this campaign, we respect every vote as equal, regardless as to when it was cast. And I'd like to personally thank everyone who has been a part of this campaign. Behind, um, behind me and around me, I know our members of our community, from labor to environment, to our BIPOC community, to our LGBTQ community, young and old, and all of us together came here to say we believe in Seattle. And this campaign has always been about willing, about finding a way to do the hard work, to create a city where every single one of us has a place and a seat at the table. Tonight, it is clear that we must all work that much harder to bring our city together in order to move us forward. Because as leaders, it is our responsibility to build a better Seattle for the next generation in our city. And the Seattle that I know, the Seattle that I love, is one that I am also extraordinarily confident in knowing that our future will be bright. Tonight, we can all take a little bit of a rest after this extraordinarily long and brutal campaign. We can take a moment to reconnect with our loved ones, maybe even prepare a home-cooked meal, maybe even blow uh, the dust off of those books sitting on my nightstand for well over a year at this point. But I do want to just reflect on something that is critically important. The next mayor, whether it's me or Bruce Harrow, will take office in January, the middle of the winter, and thousands will still be living on the streets and in our parks. An eviction ban that has kept thousands of families from joining them will be ending. 
there will be an extraordinary amount of work to do to prevent simultaneous housing, public safety, and public health crises across the city. And we know that as we do the work right in front of us, we need to begin to unwind the economic inequities that push families like mine, like ours, further and further behind. So rest tonight because we know that our work has just begun. And if we're going to do this work of rebuilding our neighborhood, reforming public safety, keeping our families safe, and helping small businesses like the one we're at today recover, we have to do it with a vision for the Seattle that we can be and refuse to go backwards every day. I have had the privilege and honor of serving as your citywide council member for six years. That work has been challenging, but it has also been the most rewarding work of my life. And I do that work every day because I'm committed to the people of the city and to the vision of the city that we can be. And I want to thank my husband, Cameron. Let's hear it for Cameron. This, this campaign not only took um, uh, months off of our lives and gave us gray hair, um, we, we, have, we have gained much during this campaign, especially community, but we have also lost a lot as a family. And I want to thank my mom, who's watching my baby girl right now, our baby girl right now. And my older sister, who's here from Kansas City, and her son, Benjamin, my nephew. My brother-in-law is somewhere around here. I don't know where he went, but I, but I, um, you know, I, I do want to acknowledge the amount of sacrifices that my family has made to support me in this effort to be a strong leader in our city. And again, there's still well over 50% of the votes to count in this race. And um, between our campaign and our labor allies, we knocked close to 100,000 doors. So we, we are used to being the underdog in every which way. And this campaign is certainly no exception. But one thing is clear, we came together, we fought hard, and we said we will unapolog unapologetically stand for working families and our right to live, work, and thrive right here in the city of Seattle. I also want to thank our labor partners from SEIU 775, 6, 925, 1199, UFCW, Unite Here. These labor unions represent the best of our essential workers, our heroes, over the last year and a half, helping us survive the pandemic. And without their support, without their help, without their counsel, I would not be standing where I am today. So thank you to our brothers, sisters, siblings in the labor movement for believing in me and trusting me to carry your voice every single day in this campaign. And lastly, uh, before we all go back to drinking some beer and uh, dreaming about the number of votes that are still left to be counted in this race, I want to I want to thank my campaign staff, Alex Corin, my campaign manager, <laughs> Maya Gillette, uh, who works as a campaign associate, Catherine Bobman, Jay Fiona, um, Heather Weiner. Um, so many tremendous people who have shown up every single day um, to work on this campaign. And Vanya Adazme, somewhere around here, is my field director. Um, we, we, we are so proud of this campaign, and every day we fought hard for each other and for a better Seattle. And that work begins. It just begins. We will not stop until we have the Seattle that we all deserve. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Seattle mayoral candidate Lorena Gonzalez speaking there, uh, talking about how not all of the votes are counted, that there's still about 50% left to be counted, but she is trailing quite a bit to Bruce Harrell. Progressive candidates do have a big comeback historically in Seattle, but that is a, that is a huge gap to overcome. Bringing back in Brandy Cruz to do some analysis for us here. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's a pretty steep gap to overcome, even in a city where progressives make up, um, make up ballots in, in late returns. Just to give you kind of an idea here, so far 131,000 ballots have been counted in Seattle. If we look back to the last mayoral race, about double of that were counted. So as she said, we're anticipating about, you know, 50% more ballots uh, remaining. So they're probably going to skew in Lorena Gonzalez's favor. Uh, but gosh, um, and you kind of heard it in her voice there, that is a really tough deficit to make up. It sounded an awful lot like a concession speech, I will say. You know, one thing I want to note about Lorena Gonzalez, regardless of how you might feel about her politics or her performance as the president of the city council, her story is quite remarkable. You know, she grew up as a first generation American. Her parents worked on my migrant uh, farms in uh, central and eastern Washington. She worked with them when she was as young as eight years old. She mentioned her mom there. When I spoke to her for uh, the last interview prior to the campaign, one of the things I told her, you know, I said, your story is it's just a, it's a great American story, no matter how you feel about her politics. Uh, and I said, what would it mean to you to win? And she says, she said it would be validation for her family, validation for her mother and all the sacrifices that they gave to her. But, you know, one of the things that Lorena Gonzalez should know is, um, you know, winning the mayoral's race isn't what would give her validation. She's been city council president in one of the largest cities in America. Uh, and so, you know, I think her mom already has a lot to be proud of. And yeah. she gives up her position as a Seattle city, Seattle city council person by running for mayor here. Mm -hmm. So she may have thoughts on another, you know, run for office at some point if yeah. she doesn't pull ahead. Yeah, and she, uh, you guys might recall, she ran very briefly for attorney general when everybody thought Jay Inslee, uh, you know, he was running for president, well, he wasn't going to run again, and then uh, Bob Ferguson was going to run for governor, so she decided to run for attorney general and then backed out again. Um, let's take a look, by the way, at uh, results for Seattle City Attorney, because we have those coming in, and we've said that this race is probably more consequential, yeah. honestly, than mayor. Yeah, we're looking here. Ann Davison leading by 59% with uh, 74,000 votes over Nicole Thomas Kennedy. Earlier we were talking about uh, how kind of contentious this race has been. In the highlight of for for uh, Nicole Thomas Kennedy, of course, are the tweets and just how different their perspectives are. And for Seattle City Attorney, but this is a big deal for the people, for the citizens of Seattle who want to see real change in so many ways. Brandy, bring us in on that. This is a live look at Ann Davison. All smiles, as you can see there. Ann Davison's third campaign in three years lost a race for Seattle City Council in 2019, switched parties. Lost a race for attorney general, or not attorney general, uh, lieutenant governor as a Republican. Uh, and now, and I never thought in my career I would say these words, uh, Seattle voters might have just elected a Republican. Uh, hasn't happened in decades in the city. And, and what that shows, going back to the tweets, yeah. I don't believe this is so much, you know, we haven't called the race, obviously, an election of Republican as it is a rejection of Nicole Thomas Kennedy and her ideas at a time, you know, she's a she's an abolitionist. She wants to be the top prosecutor, yet she doesn't believe in prosecution. And she had, um, you know, spent much of the campaign trying to defend her own tweets. And really, at the end of the day, if she loses, I believe it is those tweets that will have done her in. And people who walk through the city of Seattle and don't feel safe and see the crime yeah. and see the huge homelessness problem and want somebody that's going to step in and take care of things with compassion, but also, you know, hold people accountable. And that's the way Ann has presented her campaign. Well, and it's an interesting shift to see. You know, in 2019, you had the more business-friendly kind of, I want to say law and order, because I don't know that there was many law and order candidates in Seattle. But in 2019, the kind of more pro-business, pro-police slate, you know, lost. <laughs> and then the, the folks that were more progressive won. And you had a socialist Seattle City Councilman Chamas Wong get another um, term in office. Uh, and so to see, you know, the shift in the electorate over just two years is pretty fascinating, but it has yeah. to do with a lot of those issues you mentioned. Not over yet, but the pendulum seems yeah. to be swinging towards the moderate candidates. Let's yeah. go out to the South Sound, though, and take a look at the Tacoma mayor's race. Victoria Woodard's leading in this race over Steve Haverly, a newcomer politically. Uh, she has 58% of the vote and a pretty strong showing from Steve, uh, given that she really has the name recognition here. She does, um, but, you know, there has been a lot of issues in Tacoma around policing, around safety, you know, really, you know, 
know, th these issues aren't isolated to the city of Seattle. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly those are challenges that they're facing in Tacoma as well. And so for voters who uh, obviously know who she is, um, but really felt as if there were public safety issues um, that, that weren't being dealt with appropriately, that's probably why you see. Um, you know, and Seattle also isn't as blue as, uh, I mean, Tacoma isn't as blue mm -hmm. as Seattle is either, so. Well, do you think in the South Sound those numbers will narrow, or do the progressive candidates tend to increase their vote there as well? Well, yeah, you kind of, you see the same trend, and here's why. More moderate or even Republican voters, they tend to vote early, because they skew a little bit older, right? You get that ballot, and you're like, oh, this is what I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do today. This is my thing today. Uh, and then progressives, as you get a little bit younger, you know, I don't want to throw everybody into the same bundle, but, you know, you're, you're busier, maybe you're going to school, maybe you're working a jobs and so you don't get that ballot in quite as quickly and so that's why we tend to see the skew that we do and that's really across the board not just in Seattle do you feel like to do you feel like mayor Woodards has done enough to to hold her position to remain in office as the mayor she probably will and I'll tell you something about Victoria Woodards that woman is everywhere I mean yeah. she really is someone I remember during the riots in 2020 um, there's this picture that really to me epitomizes uh, the the style of leadership that she has there was these kids out doing you know in the middle of a highway on top of the hood of a car and she's out there middle of the night with a raincoat on like it looks like she just hopped out of bed like pointing a finger at him like you need to get, get off the street and that's sort of how she is as mayor um, and so you know I think she's endeared herself to a lot of people in that city clearly those results show though you know she's not where she can we bring those back up again uh, not not really where you want to be as an incumbent uh, necessarily at 58 percent it's a it's a good lead but as an incumbent I'm sure she wanted it to be a little bit better uh, but, you know, she has a, a style of leadership that I think endears people to her. All right, Brandy, we'll have more on that coming up. We're also going to cover some of the other local key races across the region as we head to break and hear some of the results.